Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. July 31st, 2009. Uh, my home group is Fifth Tradition. I have a sponsor who has a sponsor, and I sponsor other women. Um, okay. So, no idea what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, so, I am a native Atlantan. I grew up in Gwinnett County. And, you know, it's funny when I first got sober, I was very into therapy and my traumatic childhood and my alcoholic family and the enmeshment that my mother and I had and all of that. And it's funny after getting sober and being in the rooms and especially being at fifth tradition, I have realized that really none of that mattered. Um, none of that really had much of an impact on me at all as an alcoholic or really any of my issues. My, my primary issue is my self-centeredness, um, and how self-absorbed I am. Um, it's funny. I, I have one child and I'm thinking about maybe having another child. Um, and my child is four and I was thinking about, you know, the effect of it on him. And is he going to be, is he going to feel neglected and is he going to be jealous and all of this? And, and I, remembered what it was like when I was nine and we had my little brother. And I don't think that it ever occurred to me that anyone was paying any less attention to me. Um, we have home movies that I've been watching recently. Um, and literally it, there's so much of it of my mom going, Leslie, get out of the way, get out of the way. We're trying to, we're trying to film your brother, get out of the way. And I'm just like, there I am. Um, <laughs> because it never occurred to me that maybe you didn't want to see what I was showing. Um, so in some, in some ways I don't think that changed, but, um, so yeah, I mean, as a child, my first drink was when I was 17. Um, which is ironically the age that I was when my father got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I haven't quite figured out the significance of that, if there is significance, um, but that is what happened. Um, and I do remember trying to um, keep track of my dad's drinking. He started um, drinking what I considered might be heavily when I was about... Um, I don't know, 12, but that was also when we, we learned in health class about alcoholism. So it could also kind of go hand in hand with my hypochondria, um, of thinking that like anything I learned about, Oh, I definitely have that. And so I didn't drink yet. So I thought, well, I couldn't have this, but maybe someone I know could. And so I just started paying way too much attention to everyone else. Um, but I mean, my dad was a fairly happy drunk, um, maybe a little bit maudlin at times, would talk about, you know, how sad he was and the demons that chased him. And I would try to comfort him and make him feel better. And I couldn't figure out why I couldn't make him feel better. And he would promise me that he would stop drinking and then he would not stop drinking. And I didn't understand that at all. Um, and I mean, throughout... Throughout even his worst drinking, things were still not really bad. Um, you know, we still had a roof over our heads. There was no abuse. Um, my mom was pretty mortified by it all. Um, we had to, you know, keep the secret and keep things looking nice on the outside, um, which, I mean, I did pretty naturally anyway. Um, but I remember when, um, when my dad got sober thinking what the heck? Like, how can you get sober some other way? And, and not for me, like, this is not fair. Um, I didn't realize the incredible self-centeredness of that thought. And I also remember I went to church and I also remember thinking of being in church and kind of just looking up going, you know what? Never mind. Like I'm going to do it my way. Don't need you. And shortly after that, I started drinking and before that, I had had a very negative opinion of alcohol. I broke up with my first boyfriend because he drank. Um, and he didn't drink excessively, just sort of like teenage drinking. Um, 
And, you know, after that, I was, my mom actually suggested that I try drinking because she said I was a bit uptight. <laughs> um, and and I, I did bring that up in therapy um, because I thought that that was wrong of her. And I blamed her for, for that and several other things, which being sober um, emotionally now, uh, looking back, she was right. I was really uptight. Um, and can still be sometimes depending on the level of my, um, emotional sobriety. Um, but yeah, I mean, looking back on it now, like I really needed that drink. I mean, I was, um, a perfectionist. I needed the best grades in the class. And it wasn't so much that I was competing with other kids as it was that I thought that if I wasn't the best, then I wasn't as good as everyone else. Like I had to have the best grades in order to be just as good as average, if that makes sense. Um, and my parents, my mom to this day, she'll be like, I don't understand why you have these self-esteem problems. You know, I, I brought project self-esteem into your classroom, um, which she did, uh, which is, you know, they, the, the moms come in the classroom and tell you how special you are and how unique you are and how smart you are. And that never did anything for me. Um, I would bring home really good grades and my parents would say, you know, you're so special. You're so smart. You could do anything. You could be the first woman president. And for some reason, all that I heard on that is you better not mess up because if you mess up, we're not going to love you anymore. And they never said that. Um, but that is totally what I heard. And I didn't realize the disconnect until I came into AA. This disconnect between people say something and I hear something different. Somebody says, oh, your hair looks really nice today. And I hear, unlike every other day. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, you know, or somebody says, let me get that door for you. And, and my response is, what do you mean by that? Um, I, somehow I twist. My perception twists everything. And it's been that way since I was little. Um, so I have this twisted perception and this need to be the best just so that I can feel adequate and also this need to control everything, right? So not only do I feel like I want to control my dad's drinking, I want to control everybody. Like you're my little Barbie dolls. Um, I had a next door neighbor who was four years younger than I was and bless her heart. Um, we would play school and of course I was the teacher and I actually had school books from like the years prior of me being in school. And so we would actually, like, I would actually teach her things that I had learned like three years before. And so when she entered the first grade, she was the only kid that knew what an organism was and how to spell it. Um, and I wouldn't let her go home one time until she could spell alligator. Um, I don't know why these but she kept coming over, actually, <laughs> unless she was afraid of the consequences of not coming over. Um, so, yes, I think I took bossy to an, an another degree. Um, <laughs> but, yes, I liked to throw parties for my friends. Everything I wanted sort of in my domain where I could control it um, or have some sort of delusion of control over it. And, um, which really, if you think about it is exhausting. I mean, I wasn't even a teenager yet when all of that happened. And when you start to become a teenager, everything changes and you don't have control over the changes and add in the alcoholic father where you don't have any idea what you're walking into when you get home. And, um, yeah, so I definitely needed that drink by the time I was 17. And, um, but I, I remember thinking, before I took the drink, I'm going to be careful with this because I do not want to end up like my father. And so we're just going to watch it. And so I had that drink and it was just like this. I'd never had anti-anxiety meds before, but it was like just this wash of relief where I could breathe and I did not care about controlling anything or anyone. And I didn't care about whether I was the best or even adequate. It just didn't matter. And I wasn't worried if my hair was perfect or whatever. It was just, it was fine. I was comfortable in my own skin and I was good. 
And I think that was the only time that I drank and it was, um, just the right amount. Um, I don't remember how much it was, but it was like, I didn't have a hangover the next day and I didn't have a blackout and I didn't embarrass myself or other people. And it was just like perfect. And I think the next 10 years was trying to replicate that one experience and missing horribly every time. Because when I drink, I have this phenomenon of craving. Um, and I don't know if I didn't have it that first time because I just like didn't know what was happening. Um, or if I just don't remember it because I'm that delusional. Um, but when I drink, I get this phenomenon of craving where I just need more and more and more. And if I try to control it and not have more, I feel like someone is peeling my skin off. Um, I have tried on multiple occasions to control it and only have a couple um, because I figured if I can only have a couple, I'm not alcoholic. And that is what I was trying to prove from the beginning, which I learned later is not normal in and of itself. <laughs> um, but I would periodically try to prove I could control my drinking. I'm just going to have two. They may be really large glasses, but still two. And then I could make myself not have any more. I would eat a lot of sugar, um, after the very large two, I'd be like, okay, I did it. And then the next night <sighs> blackout, no idea what happened, but I proved the night before I could do it. So I'm good. Mm -hmm. Um, later when I finally made it into AA, I remember reading in the big book that the definition of an alcoholic is if when you drink, you have little control over the amount you take, or cannot quit entirely, you're probably alcoholic. That definition sucks. Um, it is really broad. Like there's an or in there. So either you have little control over the amount you take or you can't quit entirely. Um, yeah, I can't do either of those actually. Um, <laughs> definitely little control. I mean, I thought no control and I was like, I have some control sometimes, but definitely little control. A hundred percent. I qualify under that. And then quitting entirely. Who wants to quit entirely? Um, I could definitely quit. I quit a lot of times. Um, so I thought, you know, if I can quit, then I'm not an alcoholic. Never really considered the entirely thing. I feel like that is an unfair qualifier. Um, <laughs> that is really extreme. Uh, I did quit a few times. Um, Actually, I called it um, taking a sabbatical. I thought that sounded much more classy. Uh, after undergrad was one of the most um, memorable ones, I went and worked at a Sylvan Learning Center administering the, the tests that they give to the, you know, there's the um, grade school kids. And my boss suggested to me that he was going to have to let me go if I didn't stop coming in reeking of alcohol, wearing the same clothes I wore the previous day. So I thought that is an excellent point. I definitely should take a break. So I decided to take a sabbatical from men and from drinking because I was definitely not going to find a husband behaving the way I was behaving. Um, I don't know why I thought those two went together, but it seemed rational to me. And so I was able to quit in my mind. I thought it was 90 days, but I think it was probably more like two months. Regardless, it was long enough to get my boss to start dating me, which was the real win. Right. Um, and I just, for whatever reason, somehow decided, well, since I was able to stop, it's going to be different now. And more ironically started drinking with my boss. Um, and I guess he thought that, thought the same thing, that because I had been able to clean up my act, then I'd be able to drink like a normal person. Um, he should have known better, I feel like, given that his family is full of alcoholics. Um, I married him also. Um, fun detail there. And uh, I, I took him hostage is really what happened. He suggested that perhaps he was not ready to be in a relationship. And I said, you are. And he said, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's the father of my four-year-old. Um, bless his heart. So yes. So then it was very shortly after that, that I was right back to where I had been. 
Um, but you know, then I was in a relationship with my boss, so it worked out much better for me in terms of the whole job situation, not so much the drinking situation. By that time I was back in school and, um, I was getting certified to teach high school. And of course I got my bachelor's degree in psychology cause that's what many of us do to try to figure ourselves out. It didn't work for me. Um, but anyways, then I taught high school English for a bit, which was super exciting. And, um, yeah, so periodically tried to not drink, found that sometimes powdered form alcohol would help me not drink because it didn't smell. Um, I didn't like it as much actually as alcohol, but it would sort of get me through, um, when I needed it to. And also surprisingly, my new husband was not very tolerant of my drinking. Uh, I found this to be surprising and tried to divorce him. I was in law school by then and I pretty much told him that we can stay together, but you're going to have to let me drink. I didn't say it like that though. I said, you're, I, you're inhibiting my, um, social development and, you know, I'm in law school now, so I need to be able to socialize and I would like to have a glass of wine with dinner. Never had a glass of wine with dinner ever and didn't even after that. Um, and go to parties and we never went to parties, um, bars. Yes. And he was like, yeah, sure. Whatever, whatever. So I should also mention that there were two stepchildren involved in this situation. They were three and five when we met. And so, yes. So I proceeded to not really hide my drinking anymore at that point. Um, no, I still hit it. I, in the evenings, I didn't hide it on the weekends. I didn't hide it, but I was still doing the little, you know, airplane bottles in the closet and, you know, show one beer that you're drinking, but in the, you know, soda that you're drinking, you put the liquor because you, the beer, you smell the beer. And then, you know, so I should be somewhat inebriated, but I don't know why I seem so much more inebriated than the one beer that you see. I'm just drinking soda. Um, <laughs> it must be the Zoloft. I don't know. It's mixing funny. Um, yes. So, and then the whole, you know, you have the, the 24 pack in the fridge that you like switch them out so that they don't know how many they are. It's exhausting really. Um, yeah. thinking about it and, you know, the whole trying to like put the empties in the, in the garbage so they're not seen, but then they clink and, just feeling so paranoid all of the time um, and very defensive at any suggestion that I might be doing something, um, I don't know, might be hiding something. It's just you have to be really defensive to be believable about things like that. And, and then, of course, you know, all of the things that I would do in a blackout. Fortunately, I didn't drive when drinking. Um, I'm a terrible driver and I don't like to drive. And so I wouldn't drive typically normally. So unless I had to, so didn't do any drunk driving. Well, much drunk driving. I mean, if the gas station was like right there, you know, and, and you only had a little bit of a buzz going and you had to just restock really quickly. I felt like that was acceptable. Um, so yeah, I was juggling a lot trying to keep this going and in law school also, which was really hard to keep going. And, um, and so yeah, my, my husband at the time, now ex-husband, I know that's shocking, um, was not happy with my behavior. Um, also because there were lots of text messages happening while I was in a blackout that were not to him, which he, no, he did find out about those. Um, and you know, I was definitely not a great spouse during those times. And, um, my, my father died actually right before I started law school and he was sober nine years when he died. And our last conversation had actually been about my drinking. Now to me, I thought that he was on my side at the time. Um, my, my husband was complaining about my drinking and I thought that he was overreacting because of all of the alcoholics in his family. And so I was telling my dad about it so that he would agree with me that my husband was being completely unreasonable. Um, 
which looking back at my behavior, I can't imagine how I ever would have thought anyone would be on my side on this. Um, because I am a crier when I drink, either I pick a fight, I cry or I disappear. And almost every single time. And so like at at Christmas, Thanksgiving, like, and my father was at these events. So I don't know how looking back, I could have thought that he would have been like, oh yeah, he's totally overreacting. Um, but that is what I expected. And he was like, well, why don't you try some controlled drinking? And I was like, "Mm hmm, what is this controlled drinking of which you speak? And he was like, you know, like try maybe having a wine spritzer. I was like, what is a wine spritzer? And he said, you know, you just, you have fill up like half a glass of wine and then the other half with, you know, club soda or something. And I'm like, that sounds like watering down your liquor. Um, but okay. So of course I found out a year and a half later when I came into AA that controlled drinking is something that you try when you think maybe you're an alcoholic, but you're not sure. Or you suggest to someone who you think might be alcoholic or struggling with it. So I realized my dad knew um, and just knew that I wasn't ready to figure it out yet, Um, which was heartbreaking that that was our last conversation. But also, I don't know, kind of touching that he was kind of already leading me down that path. Um, I would love to say that when I found out that he had died, that I immediately was like, I'm turning my life around. I'm going to AA. I'm getting sober. That is not what happened. I pretty much fell into a bottle. Um, I mean, I was able to keep my grades up some, not what I would have liked, but you know, my emotional, I was a shell of a person by the time I came in here. Um, you know, I, my bottom was not anything of, there was not the event itself was nothing of consequence. Um, I never got a DUI. Um, I never actually lost a job, although clearly it was threatened. I should have been arrested plenty of times, ran from the cops, some in college. Um, but you know, really what happened, one of my girlfriends that I grew up with from elementary school, she came to go to dinner with me and we went, we were, I was living in Woodstock at the time. We went to downtown Marietta and it was supposed to be a happy hour. And I remember the first hour of the happy hour and that's all. And I vaguely remember going to Hemingway's and the next morning I woke up and I was like, "Mm, what happened? And my husband at the time texted me and said that he had to leave the house early that morning because he couldn't bear to look at me and that he was vomiting at work from anxiety. And I asked my friend, I was like, what happened? She's like, yeah, you kind of missed the mark a little bit last night. And I was like, I mean, yeah, that happens a lot. Um, she's like, yeah, I know you really need to work on like hitting that buzz and maintaining it. And most of the time, I, any other time I would have been like, yeah, let's go practice now. <laughs> right. But for some reason that day, I was just like, I can't do it anymore. I've like, I've been trying to hit the buzz and maintain it for 10 freaking years. Like ever since the first time I drank, I've been trying to like replicate that glorious spiritual experience of that buzz that made me feel like I could breathe and was comfortable in my own skin. That like sense of ease and comfort that the book talks about. And I was just like, I'm done. Can't it anymore. And, um, and so, you know, I was like, so now what do I do? I didn't think I was alcoholic. I mean, I didn't think it was that serious. Um, it's like, you know, I don't drink every day. I mean, I I would have, if I could have gotten away with it, but you know, of course, thinking about how long alcohol stays in your bloodstream, it probably was always in my bloodstream. Um, and so I was like, I don't know what to do. And so I waited a couple of days and was basically like, climbing the rafters, hanging from the rafters, eating a lot of sugar and just like climbing out of my skin felt like someone had like put a screw in my stomach and tightened it. I was like, okay, so this is not going to work. Um, got to do something other than this. So I called my mother-in-law because I mean, she's the one that like birthed all of the alcoholics. Right. 
So, um, and had been married to one at one point and I, I told her what was going on and she was like, well, I mean, do you maybe want to go to a meeting? I was like, I don't know. So I will back up at this point to, at this point I'm 27 when I was in undergrad, I guess about 19. I, um, so my dad had been sober a couple of years over Christmas break at some point, I took my dad's big book off of the shelf and opened to the section on inventory and attempted to take my own inventory on Christmas break, which basically consisted of me writing down the things that I perceived to have been wrong that I had done in my life and essentially came to the conclusion that, oh, I'm good. I got time because it was what I perceived to be a short list. And so I thought, I didn't need to make a big deal out of this for a bit. So now looking back on that, I realize non-alcoholics probably do not attempt to take their inventory out of an Alcoholics Anonymous book, particularly not at the age of 19, over Christmas break. At the time, thought that was totally normal thing to do. Just curiosity, anyone would do it. Also went to an AA meeting, totally out of curiosity, just to see what my dad was doing. Um, You know, I mean, I had gone with him to get his chip, but this was not going with him to get his chip. This was like on campus at school, out of curiosity, just to see what it's all about there. Made sure to let everyone know that's what I was doing, which I'm sure they super appreciated. And (sighs) went to dinner with them afterwards, ordered a beer, just to show them I could do it. And only have one. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. Bless them. I need to go back and actually thank them for putting up with me back then. Um, anyway, so then fast forward to this time talking to my sweet mother-in-law, who I still love dearly to this day. And she was like, maybe you could go to an Al-Anon meeting. And I was like, ew, no, I'm not going to do that. I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm just going to do it. So... I went to my first AA meeting in Woodstock and it was a Friday night women's meeting and they thought I was there for a Bible study, which I did not appreciate. And they had me read the night step promises and, um, which were really cool, but that wasn't actually what got me. What got me was the second step, um, where it says came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And I was like, I did not know that was part of the deal. Um, I knew that my dad went to AA to get sober. I did not know the whole sanity thing was in play. Um, Because I knew I had been my whole life. Um, I mean, before I even took a drink, I had felt like I was alone in a room of people. That, like, people didn't really understand me. That I would talk to a person, and at some point they're going to give me what I call the big green bug look. At some point, I'm going to be having a conversation, and they're going to look at me like I am a big green bug, and I'm going to say something, and they're going to be like, what planet are you from? Um, People just, I just didn't relate well to people, and so I was like, if this program can get me sanity, sign me up. I will do whatever you say, and so I asked this woman to sponsor me, who turned out not to be the person I thought I was asking to sponsor me just so funny. I hear that a lot in stories. Um, but yeah, I thought this, this is really nice woman. And I went and I asked her and I realized that this was not the really nice woman that I thought I had seen from across the room. I think she was standing like three people over or something. It was this really old mean nurse, um, that terrified me. And so I called her every day and I realized now, cause I actually have a sponsee who does this. Like usually I get sponsees and they'll call like once every three days or whatever. And I'm like, why don't they follow directions? Why don't they call every day? And now I have one that calls every day and I'm like, you do not have anything to say. Why are you calling me every day? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so now I understand why she was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Great. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Um, at the time I took offense to that. I was like, she does not care what I'm saying. Um, but yes, I called her every day and, um, and we started going through the book, which for her at the time that she got sober was read the first 164 pages and we'll get together and talk about that step in the 12 and 12. And I was like, okay, we'll do that. I didn't know any other way. 
Um, and so we did that and, you know, I did my first, um, my first inventory. Well, I specifically remember doing the third step prayer, which I thought I did that with her and a sister sponsee, um, which was very cool. And then I did my first inventory with her. I remember doing that in the park and, um, I was nervous to tell this. I mean, she just had to be like 70 and I was like, I can't tell her what I've done. Um, she was really sweet about it. And she was like, I've done pretty much all of that stuff except hook up with a girl. Um, I was like, okay, well, thank you. Um, and you know, making amends really was not that eventful for me. Um, at that time, it was mostly like, I'm sorry for the stuff I did when I was drunk. And most of the people I made amends to were like, we're just happy that you're sober. Please keep doing what you're doing. Um, and amends for me got really real when I got divorced. Um, that was rough. And, you know, it was, it was also really beautiful for me. Um, I was five years sober when I got divorced and it really, I'm grateful that that's what happened. I'm grateful that I waited that long for it to happen. And my ex-husband and I have a good working relationship today. The most meaningful amends that I made from that were actually to my stepchildren who were, I guess, 15 and 17 at the time that I made amends to them. They were 14 and 16 when we got divorced. And when we got divorced, we sat them down and we told them that nothing would change, that everything would be pretty much the same, which was stupid. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think we were trying to make ourselves feel better because we knew they weren't going to take it well. I was really close to both of them. And, um, I mean, I'd been in their lives for like 10 years. Um, and you know, I, I moved and I didn't move that far. It was like 20 minutes, but still, you know, single mom, attorney, like busy. I didn't see them nearly as often as I thought I was going to. And instead of like immediately addressing it, I do what I do. I stuck my head in the sand. I was like, la, 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 this isn't happening. If I don't talk about it, then it's not real. And yeah, it was not pretty. Went on for probably six to eight months. Um, their father told me in no uncertain terms that they were very hurt and very upset. Their mother was livid with me. Um, I tried to brush it off as he was making too big a deal of nothing. If you haven't noticed, I tend to do that. And, um, Finally, my, my sponsor I had a different sponsor at this point. Um, she was like, I had a sponsor at this point that actually took me through the big book, reading the big book with me. Um, she was like, yeah, you have to make amends here and you have to get honest with them. And like, she really taught me how to make amends by putting myself in their shoes. So I was terrified. These kids were going to tear me to pieces, teenagers, a girl and a boy. Um, and she said, you know, the most effective way, and this is now how I teach my sponsees to do it, the most effective way that I've found to make amends is really to, you know, stick my neck out. Like, give them the opportunity to, like, you know, punch me if they want to. Um, put myself in their shoes and be like, I cannot imagine what this must have been like for you. I have royally screwed up. I should have been the adult in this situation. And I wasn't. And then when it didn't, like, I never should have told you that it was going to be the same because that's ridiculous. There's no way it could have been the same. And then when it wasn't the same, I should have been the adult and come to you and said, clearly this isn't working out the way that we thought it was. Let's address it now and figure out what we can do. And I didn't do that. I buried my head in the sand like a child and tried to pretend like it didn't exist. And I'm so sorry that I did that to you. Um, you know, and <sighs> that I told them that I still wanted to have a relationship with them if they would have me. And if we could figure out some way that was realistic, that I could be in their lives. And both of them, I met with them separately. Both of them were so sweet and said that they had just missed me and they just wanted to see me. And so I, um, I've had breakfast with each of them once a month. Um, sometimes it ends up being like once every six weeks, but especially the older one, he's now in college and it's a bit of a mess, but, um, you know, and I've put it in my calendar and we do it. I'm actually having breakfast with, um, 
the girl, Gabrielle, tomorrow morning. And, um, and their mom still wouldn't talk to me, (laughs) um, until last month. Um, well, I sent her a Christmas gift or whatever. And she's like, thanks for the Christmas gift. Um, which of course I was like, I should totally get more than that. Um, (laughs) but over, I guess, Thanksgiving, um, my stepson was arrested with some weed in his car and just a little bit, but still like he was in jail and everything. And I took him to breakfast in January and he told me that his court date was coming up (sighs) and that he did not want his mother to go with him because that is embarrassing. He's 19. And I was like, well, I can go with you. He was like, literally this kid teared up and he was like, really? Can you? I was like, yes. Uh, fortunately I'm now in, an in-house attorney, so I have more flexibility and everything. Um, and so like, he was serious about it. I was like, you have to like, send me the information, all of that thinking like, he's not going to send me the information. Cause like, sometimes he like oversleeps and misses our breakfast because he's a teenager. Um, he like immediately sent me the information, like called me the night before at like one in the morning, like I can't sleep, um, all worried about it. And like, I went with them and we were able to like get the information for him to get in the diversion program. And I was able to like, one of my friends, the prosecutor, I was able to find like an attorney for, for them to have or whatever. And like his mom texted me like the night before he went to court and like thanked me for going with him and like said that she was so happy that he would have somebody with him. And I was like... I wasn't even trying to get your attention this time. Um, (laughs) um, But it just shows me the beauty of this program, you know? And after we were leaving the court, like he hugged me and thanked me so much for coming. And I was like, dude, thank you for wanting me to be here with you. Like there, I can't even tell you how much it means to me. Like you would trust me to come with you for something like this. I mean, after all that we've been through, Um, it's just incredible to me that, things can be repaired like that, you know? And it's just like with consistency of showing up. Cause I mean, literally this child told his father that I had abandoned him. Um, and he trusted me to go to court with him in a situation like that is incredible. Um, so yeah, amends are amazing. And I'm not one who likes to take responsibility for mistakes. So, um, And I will say that, um, step 11 has been a challenge for me just in terms of the discipline piece, reading pages 86 to 88 every day. Um, I am not disciplined. I, if I don't want to do something, I generally don't do it. So I have had to make myself do it every morning. My alarm goes off. I have the 12 step companion on my phone. I literally, like pull it up, read it, say my prayers in the bed before I get out of bed. Otherwise it doesn't happen. Um, the whole, when we retire at night, um, my, I got remarried in October, um, to someone in the program and he and I actually like say our nightly prayer at the same time before we usually watch TV and fall asleep watching TV and then go to bed. And so before we like sit down to watch TV at night, we actually do the nightly review then because we noticed that Otherwise we just fall asleep and then we don't do it. And it says when we retire at night, not like when we go to sleep at night. That was an important distinction for me in getting myself to remember to do the thing. Um, which I guess if remembering to do, it's the biggest problem. It's probably good. Um, and honestly, sponsorship is probably tied on amends for me is, is the biggest, you know, bless you. Um, sponsorship is the bright spot in my life today. You know, I was wigging out before coming in here today. Um, my husband and I got into a stupid spat before I left the house. Um, we never fight about anything that means anything. It's always just like ridiculous little miscommunications that like either he takes personally or I blow way out of proportion. That's the other thing I do is I'll take one tiny little thing and be like, so you mean this means this? It never means that. It just means a tiny little thing. Um, but I can't see that in the moment and I can't let go either. And so I needed something to totally distract me. And one of my, my friends sponsees is having some ex-husband issues. And I was like, Oh, I can help with that. I have experience on that. And 
you know, it's just sponsorship and, and fellowship are the bright spots in my life today. You know, I, I love my husband dearly. I love my son dearly, but my sponsor once told me like the good drugs are in sponsorship. And that is totally true. Nothing brightens my day as much as talking to another woman in this program and taking them through the book and seeing them get it. Um, it's really an incredible experience. And every time I take another woman through the book, I learn more about this program. I feel like my understanding deepens and my, my growth is broader and deeper. Um, I really feel like, you know, not only does it, they say like insurance policy on my own sobriety, but it's, um, I don't know. It's, it's, you learn by teaching, I guess. Um, and, of course, I, I feel like I need to give back what was given to me. Absolutely. But it's just, um, another way that I can learn to love myself. Actually the only way, um, you know, I'll, I'll see in different sponsees pieces of myself and I can love those pieces of them and I can't love them in myself. Um, you know, going through a fourth step with somebody, some things that I've done that maybe I'm ashamed of. I can share those with another woman and realize that that experience that I have can be helpful to somebody and I don't need to be ashamed of it anymore um, because it can be helpful. And so that thing that I was so ashamed of can come into the light and be useful. Um, and, you know, working with other women is the only way that I can get those things. Um, and it gets me out of myself, which is still my number one problem. Um, so yeah, I have a few sponsees that sponsor and a couple that, um, could be, but aren't yet. And I just encourage them to get out there, get to beginners meetings, go find, um, new women and give it a shot because it's really not about the messenger. It's about the message. And, you know, that, that first sponsor that I had, you know, with what I know now, I'm like, Oh, she did it wrong. She taught me wrong. Um, but it didn't matter at all how she did it because I was ready and I was willing to do anything to get it. And that's all that matters. Um, so that's really all I have tonight. Thank you guys so much for having me and hope you guys, um, got something used to lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.